Happy Earth Day! My name is Alex Martin and I'm a faculty fellow in the Anthropology Department at the University of New Hampshire. Today we'd like to welcome you to this series, Honoring the Mother of All People, Contemporary Indigenous Leadership in Revitalizing Environmental and Cultural Sustainability. The organizers and participants would like to thank the Saul O. Sador Memorial Lecture Series, the Center for the Humanities, and the Indigenous New Hampshire Collaborative Collective for this event. This lecture series was established in 1965 in memory of Saul O. Sador of Manchester, New Hampshire. The purpose of the series is to offer the university community and the state of New Hampshire programs which raise critical and sometimes controversial issues facing our society. The University of New Hampshire Center for the Humanities sponsors these programs. We will begin by making our event a sacred space with a prayer and smudging by our panelist, Louise Prophet LeBlanc. Let's ask for a blessing today for our earth that we all live upon. Ask for the safety and protection of all of its peoples, all of its creatures, all living things. Masi. Thank you, Louise. Today's panel is the fourth event in a series and we encourage you to visit the Center for the Humanities website posted in the chat to learn about the other events. I would like to remind everyone in the audience that this event is being recorded and will be available for later viewing on the website. Audience members' cameras and mics have been turned off by our host. At the bottom of your screen, there's a button that says Q&A. Please feel free to send in your questions as they come up. You don't need to wait until the end of the event. Our panelists will answer questions from the audience toward the end of the program. Now I'd like to introduce Paul and Denise Puglio, who will open this event with an Abenaki greeting song. Denise Puglio Thank you, Paul and Denise. Denise Puglio is the Sagamo Squaw female head speaker of the Kawasak Band of the Penacook Abenaki people, a traditional artist, a federal religious advisor, and currently serves on the New Hampshire Commission on Native American Affairs. She is the treasurer for Coas North America and the Abenaki Nation of Vermont. Paul Puglio has been the Sagamo or chief speaker for the Kawasak Band of the Penacook and Abenaki people and president of Coas North America and the Abenaki Nation of Vermont since 1990. Paul is an Indigenous historian, lecturer, federal religious advisor, and a founding member of the New Hampshire Commission of Native American Affairs. Paul and Denise are also founding members of the Indigenous New Hampshire Collaborative Collective and affiliate faculty members of the UNH uh, Native American and Indigenous Studies minor. 
we'd like to highlight the new Native American and Indigenous, Indigenous Studies minor at UNH. This is an interdisciplinary program that offers a broad understanding of the history, lands, culture, literature, language, and artistic expression, science and technology, race and identity, and political statuses of Native American and Indigenous people within and beyond North America. And now Alyssa Moreau, who is a senior at UNH and a Native American and Indigenous Studies minor student, will deliver a local land acknowledgement. Hello, everyone. This event takes place on Intakma, which is the traditional ancestral homeland of the Abenaki, Cook, <laughs> and Wabanaki peoples, past and present. We acknowledge and honor with gratitude the land and waterways the Alnabak people have stewarded Nadakima throughout generations. We also honor the Nacho Nayakdan First Nation, whose traditional territory is situated in the Northern Yukon. Thanks, Alyssa. And now I'll introduce our moderator for today's event. Cheryl Savageau is an Abenaki poet, memoirist, storyteller, and textile artist. Her latest book, just out from the University of Nebraska Press, is Out of the Crazy Woods, a memoir that navigates her experience of living with bipolar manic depressive illness. She also has three books of poetry, Motherland, an unhistory of the Northeast, Dirt Road Home, which was a finalist for the Patterson Poetry Prize and nominated for a Pulitzer Prize, and Home Country. Her children's book, Muskrat Will Be Swimming, was a Smithsonian notable book and won the Skipping Stones Award for Children's Environmental Literature and the Wordcraft Circle's Children's Book of the Year Award. She has won fellowships in poetry from the National Endowment for the Arts, the Massachusetts Artists Fellowship Program, and is a three-time fellow at McDowell. Savageau has mentored Native writers through the Wordcraft Circle of Native Poets and Storytellers and was awarded Mentor of the Year in 1998. She has taught workshops through Gendakina and is former editor of Donland Voices 2.0. Her work has ap appeared most recently in Yellow Medicine Review, the Cape Cod Review, and Inchas de Poesia, and is widely anthologized. Her work has been exhibited at the Abbey Museum and at UNH. She teaches indigenous literatures and creative writing at the Breadloaf School of English at Middlebury College. Welcome, Cheryl. Thank you. Kwa Indaluisi Cheryl Savage, Albasqua, Wobanaki, Nia, Indai, Naransovak, Tawobiadanak, Takobek, Takum Sigma. Hello, my name is Cheryl Savage. I'm Western Abenaki. My family comes from Western Maine, the White Mountains, Quebec, and Quinsigman. I'm coming to you from the traditional homelands of the Wampanoag, the people of the first light, who have lived here on the eastern shore of what is now Massachusetts for over 12,000 years. Uliani Wampanoag Nidombak. It is my pleasure to introduce tonight's storytellers. Louise Prophet LeBlanc is a traditional storyteller from the Nacho Nayak Dun First Nation of the Yukon Territory in Northern Canada. Her 30 year commitment to the cultural and artistic heritage of her people includes being co founder of two seminal organizations of the Yukon the Yukon International Storytelling Festival and the Society of Yukon Artists of Native Ancestry. Both of these organizations helped to inspire an artistic revival and recognition of indigenous art in the territory. Louise worked for several years as the Yukon Native Heritage Advisor for the Yukon government, recording traditional stories relative to Yukon geographical place names. She pays tribute to the many elders she was privileged to work with for over a decade ensuring these precious stories were captured for future generations. Louise worked for over 11 years to help advance Aboriginal art in Canada through her position at Canada Council for the Arts, where she served as coordinator for the Aboriginal Arts Office and Strategic Initiatives. In addition to her work with the Canada Council for the Arts, Louise continues to respond to requests from regional and local Aboriginal gatherings, festivals, and inner city school programs, sharing traditional stories and providing a framework of curriculum for teachers to use in their classes. She has also been a featured guest storytelling teller at international storytelling festivals, including venues in Germany, the Netherlands, Norway, Greenland, Scotland, the USA, Belize, and Hawaii, as well as at many national indigenous artistic gatherings within her home nation of Canada. Welcome, Louise. Our second storyteller is Anne Jennison, 
who is a traditional storyteller with European and Abenaki heritage, who holds master's degrees in both history and storytelling. She is on the New Hampshire State Council on the Arts Traditional Artist Roster as an indigenous storyteller and traditional Abenaki craftsperson. Anne believes her worldview and her voice as a storyteller have been shaped by the content of the traditional lesson stories that she has internalized through telling for more than 30 years. Anne is a co-creator of the People of the Dawnland exhibit about the Abenaki Wabanaki peoples at Strawberry Bank Museum in Portsmouth, New Hampshire, and is a member of the Indigenous New Hampshire Collaborative Collective, an affiliate faculty member for the University of New Hampshire's Native American and Indigenous Studies minor, and is also currently serving on the New Hampshire Commission on Native American Affairs. Welcome, Anne. All of us tell stories every day. We tell stories about our friends, our family, what's happened to us, what important or silly thing we've done. At family dinners and holidays, many families retell stories they've heard from the past or share new stories from their lives. Traditional stories are a bit different, especially the deep time stories you'll be hearing tonight. These stories have been on a long journey and deserve respect. Stories are told all the time to entertain, to teach whenever they are needed. Stories often ask to be told because they have something to say at that particular time and place. And I remember being told that if an elder tells you a story, you better watch out. You might find yourself in that story. Traditional stories are often told during the winter time, during the dark time. Um, if you think about it, electric lights and TV have only been around in the most industrialized countries for just about a hundred years. And because the stories were told to the whole community, there's something in the stories for all ages, for children, for adults, for elders. Stories entertain and they teach. For those of us who are tellers, we know that we learn even from the stories we've been telling for years. And from my own experience as a teacher, I can say that students remember stories better than they remember facts. As you listen to Louise tell her story, notice how she acknowledges her story as a gift and quotes from the gifter, showing that the story is part of an ongoing tradition. Um, note the many details that she tells you that show how the story is embedded in the land and how it teaches the people how to live. And also the eloquence of her telling, the use of repetition to create emphasis and rhythm timing and the tone of her voice. Today we're here together by Zoom and listening to videotapes of the stories, which is very different from a telling where we are all in one space together. But maybe we can build a little virtual fire and all sit around it together. Storytelling is a reciprocal relationship between the teller and listener. So even though we are not together physically, we can give back to the teller by listening attentively. As you listen, think, how do these stories speak to you? What might you take from them into your life? And as Louise said, jokingly, listen as if there will be a quiz. Here's Louise. Well, it's my great honor today to be amongst you and to share a story that's very uh, important to me. And it's also important to Northern peoples. My name is Louise Prophet LeBlanc, and my uh, Indigenous name is Ted Anna, and I'm from the Yukon Territory, from the Nacho Nayak Dun First Nation. And Nacho means big river. So um, this is where I'm from. And are people dependent on the herds of caribou? and also on the moose that lived in our region. So I wanna tell you this beautiful story that was shared with me by Auntie Mary Vitraqua, who lived in this Northern region up in the Blackstone region of the Yukon territory where all the caribou, the porcupine caribou herd live. So that's what this story is about. And she um, gifted me with this story in the early 90s, and I want to honor her with this story. She said, years ago, there was a couple, and this couple lived alone. 
even though there was a winter camp and a summer camp, this couple, they always lived apart from the people. They didn't have children. And maybe this is the reason that they separated themselves. I don't know, she said. They prayed, they made offerings. They went and they saw a person who is a medicine man to help them to have children, but it never happened. Finally, as they grew older, they just accepted the fact that they would not have children. This was very hard for them. Now, one day, this woman was out running her snares. They used to set little snares on the land to catch small birds called ptarmigan. They're very delicious little birds. And she would set snares. And these snares were made out of eagle feathers. Each eagle feather can make two snares. And she had a whole bunch of them on her little belt that was around her parka. And she was going out to run her snares to see how many ptarmigan she caught that morning. And she thought she heard something. And she did. She heard a baby crying. She was kind of shocked. What's going on? Hmm. And she walked towards the crying. Auntie Mary said she couldn't believe it. Here there was a baby laying there beside a little small spruce tree. Of course, the spruce trees there grow very, very small. Take a long time to grow because of the short growing season. And here this baby was laying there and the umbilical cord was attached to this little spruce tree. She couldn't believe it. She thought she gave thanks right away. She gave thanks. She took out her little knife and she cut the umbilical cord and she put the baby into her parka and went home so full of joy. She couldn't believe that the creator had gifted her with a little boy. And when her husband came home, he couldn't believe it either. He was thrilled. He was so happy they had a baby boy. So, of course, the woman couldn't feed the baby right away. So she made a little soup out of caribou. She took a little piece of the skin. She dipped it into the soup and that baby sucked on that caribou soup for a while. But she put the baby to her breast every day until she began to draw milk. And she was able to feed this little boy. Now, sometimes that little boy got very cranky. And the mother didn't know how to calm him. But intuitively, somehow she knew. And she went out of their little caribou hide tent, which was like dome-shaped tent. She went out when there was a full moon and she would show the baby. She said, Tujri, Tujri. And the baby would stop crying. She thought to herself, he's a moon boy. He's from the moon. They're given to us from the moon people. This little boy. She told her husband about that. So they treated him very specially. They just took care of him. And the thing that they noticed about him right away was that he wasn't growing tall. He grew in his mind. He developed that way. He was strong, but he was very short. And because he was so short and built close to the ground, he got cold when he walked on the tundra. So his mother made him some little pants and she made these pants out of marten. That's why they call him thuksul. That means a marten skin pants. So he had these little fur pants. And that's how he became known as thuksul. So time passed and oftentimes people have this imagination that indigenous people lived all the time in such comfort. 
but there are many periods in history where there was great suffering, starvation, perhaps a big fire burned through. Winter came very quickly. Maybe it was a short summer or perhaps a rainy fall. Everything was dependent on the environment and the weather. And this one year, the caribou took a different trail. So this year, instead of the caribou coming through where the people would be ready for them with all the caribou corrals, and what would happen is that they would drag spruce trees from a long ways away every winter on their toboggans to make these huge corrals in which the women and children would holler when the caribou were coming through in their migration path and rush them into the chute into the corral, which would be closed off. And all the men that were standing around this corral would take their arrows and their clubs and slaughter their winter food. They would slaughter these caribou. There was nothing. People were dying. You could hear babies crying. Mothers had no milk. Even this old couple that had the little boy, moon boy, Tushri, Tuxul. Them too, they didn't have much food. Now that little boy, he said to his mother, Mom, what's going on? And she said, Caribou is not coming this year. He take different trail. Winter came too soon, we didn't get enough fish. I can bring caribou, he said. I'm gonna try. You think so? Yes, I'm gonna try, he said. Ah. He went outside of the little tent and he broke off some sticks from a little willow. He's gonna use those little sticks to make a sound, a beating sound, like this. He said, I'm gonna sing a song and I'm gonna dance and I'm gonna call the caribou back for the people. Ah, oh, son, you think so? He said, I'm gonna try. Now you go tell the people, he said, you go tell the people I'm going to do this for them. And all I want for this job I'm going to do to keep the people alive, he said, I want the stomach fat. Now the caribou, when you take the guts out of the caribou, around the stomach of the caribou is this fat. It's a layer, very thin fat. They call it lace fat in English. Indigenous people call it hutsieta, means a, the encasement of the stomach. And if you hold it up to the light, it looks like lace almost. So in English, they call it lace fat. It's very powerful stuff. In fact, it's important for hunters to have this because when they're out on the trail and they need more energy, they just pop a little bit of that fat into their mouth chew it up and they get energy from it. They dry it, they hang it in the cache and smoke it a little bit and so it's been cured. That's all I want, he said. Okay, okay, son. And she went down and she told the people, my son is gonna make medicine. He's gonna dance, he's gonna sing to bring caribou back. All he wants, when you get caribou, he wants the stomach fat. Ah, so go ahead, try. So the woman walked back up to her camp. She told the boy, yes, they all agreed. They all agreed to do this. So 
the little boy did that. He got them little sticks outside of their tent, started to make this noise and dance. Now that old woman that told me the story, Auntie Mary, she said, I'm sorry, Sitchi, I can't remember the song, but he sang a good song. Pretty soon he looked up on the rise. What's up there? Bull caribou. That's the one, he's a leader. He's a chief of caribou people. He goes ahead, he looks to make sure everything's okay. Hmm. Behind him, lots of caribou come. Oh boy, those people were happy. Even though the women were weak, they went out and made lots of noise, banging things together to, to steer those caribou into the corral. They cut, they cut it off like this, put the gate up, and the men began to use their arrows and their clubs and spears to get their winter food. So Thuk Thul and his mom were sitting in the tent. Even his father went out there to be part of the slaughter of all those caribou. And they sat there for a long time. Pretty soon Thuk Thul said to his mother, how come nobody bring me fat? And his mother said, be patient, son. They're working with the meat. They're going to bring it to you. And Sukthul just waited there for quite a while. In the afternoon, he said, what kind of people I live with? All these years I've been living with these people and they're not trustworthy. What kind of people I live with? No, she said, that's not true. Son, they're busy with meat. You watch, they're going to bring it to you. Be patient, she said to him. Mm. He waited there. Nobody came. And the wheat lead, he said. And the wheat lead. Tuzri. I want to go back to my people, he said. I don't want to live amongst people I can't trust. I want to go back, he said. Oh, son, don't even think about it, he said. Pretty soon her husband came back from the hunt too. People bring you fat, he said. People bring you what you want? No. He said, people here are not trustworthy. And a wait late, he said. I'm going to go back to my home. Oh, no. That night, they didn't want him to go, so they put him, they put that little boy in bed with them, in between them. But despite that, when they woke up in the morning, here they saw little pants up there, Suksu's little pants in the smoke hole. He had gone back to the moon. They felt very sad. Now every year in the spring, big full moon, caribou start moving from the Yukon up to Alaska. That's where they calf. They stay there all summer. And they start coming back in the late fall, around November. Big moon again. That's when they move and they winter in the Yukon. And if you look up at the moon, you're going to see that little boy there, Tutsu. He's standing there, he's holding that fat. <laughs> That's a story.
Kitsi Uliuni, thank you so much, Anne, for sharing the gift of this story. The next story we're gonna hear is from Anne and she will be sharing another deep time story with us, the Abenaki, the Abenaki creation story. As you listen, it's important to understand that creation is not something that happened only once a long time ago. Creation stories, like all deep time stories, are happening all the time. They continue today. So as you listen to her stories, think about what, she's, uh, what this says about Abenaki people now, how this story comes alive in this moment and what it says to you. What teaching can you learn from this story? Traditional Abenaki storytelling uses a kind of call and response where the teller says, ho, and the listeners respond, hey. It's kind of like a we hear you or amen. And I can tell you that as a storyteller, when you hear that, hey, it gives you energy. When we all say, hey, together, we know that at this moment, we are all of the same mind. And the teller knows if she says, ho, and she hears the hey, that you're paying attention. She can also use it to create tension or movement. So I want to invite you, as Anne tells her story, to listen for the ho and respond, even though she can't hear you, with hey. And here she is, Anne. Long ago, after Double Doc, the owner creator, uh, created all of, well, all of creation, everything, the sun and the moon and the stars and all the planets beyond, but especially this earth that people were aware of at that time. The two-legged were here and the swimming creatures, the flying creatures. But Tabatak looked and thought, you know, something, I mean, we need something else and decided to create the Alnobak, the human beings. This is the Abenaki word for people or person or the humans is the Alnobak. Everybody in their own language, the indigenous people have their own word for who they are. And then there are the words that other people call them. So the Abenaki people, that means the people of the East. Abenaki and Wabenaki actually mean the same thing. They mean the people of the Dawnland. Um, and that's how other indigenous tribes identify these people who live in the Northeast. Um, Abenaki themselves, ourselves, they use the word Alnabak, which means the human beings. So in each tribal group, the name for yourself, you're the human beings, uh, but other people call a name, like the Lakota people, Lakota, Nakota, Dakota, from out in the Great Plains, other people call them the Sioux, which is actually kind of a pejorative term, um, but they call themselves by their own tribal names, which pretty much mean the real human beings. So Double Duck decided to create human beings. This creation was a wonderful place, but it needed human beings to appreciate it and to take care of it. Oh, hey. So Double Duck looked around creation, trying to decide what would be the best material to use to make these two-legged creatures from, these, these Alnabak, and found here in the Northeast, there were huge rocks, big boulders that were left over from thousands of years ago when the last glaciers were receding and Tabaldak was looking around. By the time he decided to make human beings, a lot, a lot, not all, but a lot of the ice was gone and there were big rocks left and they looked sturdy and strong. And so Tabaldak took some of those granite boulders and turned them into the first human beings. And they were huge and they were strong and they were all made of stone. So they would last for a long, long time. But they were so big and so strong and so hard that they weren't careful. They weren't careful where they stepped. They were not careful who they stepped on, oh, okay. So they actually caused a lot of damage and a lot of havoc and uh, well, it wasn't a good thing. So creator decided to turn them back to what they have been. And they say that's why you still see huge granite boulders and rocks all over the Northeast today. Those are the stone people who were too cold and hard hearted to take good care of each other or good care of the earth and the beings that lived on it. So creator was looking and trying to decide what material would be the best, what would be used 
that would make human beings that would be flexible and be able to interact with the world around them. And creator noticed the ash trees and they were swaying in the breeze and they almost were dancing. So Papa got carved into the sides of these trees and the very first woman and first man stepped out. They were carved from the ash trees and they danced and they sang and they looked around the earth and they decided this was a beautiful place and they would care for it and they would tell stories. And so to this very day, the Abenaki people look to the ash trees and call them ancestors. And that's how that part of the creation story goes. Oh, hey. There are many parts of um, the ways that the Abenaki people describe how the world was created and the sun and the moon and, and different sort of epochs and at different stages of human development. And the Abenaki people are an ancient people here. You know, we have roots that go back 12,000 years. I live in the town of Lee in the New Hampshire seacoast. And in my town, there was a village that by archeological evidence existed uh, as a seasonal Abenaki village for 8,000 years, continually, right up until the colonial period when their life patterns got disrupted by the beings, the, you know, people coming from Europe and taking, uh, well, taking, there's no easy way to say that. There's no nice way to say took the land from, from the indigenous peoples. Uh, and so the Abenaki people, when that happened, started moving west and north and west and north and maybe coming back sometimes when they could. And that's another long, complicated story. We'll let that go for today. But what I want to talk about is the ancient presence and the continuing presence of the Abenaki people here today. So the stories are very, very old. And they've been passed down from one person to another, to another, to another, till there were many of them, thankfully, written down because there was a period of time when the Abenaki were not able to understand, to, to express their culture publicly. It became an unsafe thing to do. Um, and so just now, actually, in the last 30 or 40 years, there's been a resurgence, a revitalization, a, a renaissance, if you will, a rebirth of Abenaki culture. And so the stories that we're finding we're learning from other people, but we're also taking them from collections of books and cobbling them back together with the pieces that we've heard from other storytellers and, and people who pass stories along. So this little piece of story, I'm actually, I just come across and it, uh, it describes the way the human beings, um, some first things that, that came into being to, for the humans. So, this story is about two feather. And it said that a long, long time ago, so long ago, it was still cold, it was very cold and a lonely place because there were so few human beings. Oh, okay. So two feather was walking long and he was lonely. He hadn't seen any other people in a long, long time. And it was just coming on to the end of winter and he'd been so hungry. He'd been subsisting on, on uh, roots and, and plants that he could find from digging under the snow and from the inner bark of some trees and just drinking water. Well, he came as, as spring was coming one day, he walked up to the bank of a river, fast flowing, beautiful spring rushing water. And he bent over to get a drink of water and he looked down and he saw himself. And, oh, he wished it was someone else he was seeing. He was wishing he would see some friends and he wouldn't be alone anymore. And he was so disheartened. He was so sad. He just lay down on the soft, mossy bank of the river and just fell asleep. Well, he hadn't been sleeping very long when a voice said, greeted him. And he sat up looking around because he wasn't sure. And he heard like the crunching sound of, of uh, 
branches breaking as, as though someone was stepping on the ground. So he sat up and he was looking around and as he looked, he saw a beautiful woman. Oh, she was almost glowing and she had long, soft hair. Oh, she was beautiful. And he looked at her and he said, oh, I've been alone for so long. I'm so glad to see you. Would you be my wife? Would you stay with me? And I will take care of you forever. And this being looked back at him and she said, no, I can't do that, but come with me. Well, he tried to catch up with her. He really was trying to grab onto her and keep her from, from disappearing. He was so happy to see somebody, oh, okay. So he followed her and he, he was trying to get closer, but every time he got close to this woman, she went further away. He could never catch up with her. Oh, this went on all day. You know, when he was following her, if he got close, she would scoot on ahead. But anytime he had to stop to rest or get a drink of water or something to eat, she would hover close by, not close enough for him to touch, but close enough that he was reassured. Well, this went on for several days. They were going across mountains and through valleys and crossing rivers. And every time he got close to her, she would scoot further away. He never had a chance to touch her. One night they came by a lake and were just resting. He was resting for the evening because they'd been walking for so long. And he was still so lonely, he made a drum and he started playing it and singing to her about his love and how he would care for her so if she would just be his wife. Well, the next morning she went on and he followed her and they finally came to a great grassy meadow. It was huge, a long field spreading out. And she looked at him and she said to cut some of that grass and make a little pile of it. So he did. And she said to take two sticks and to rub them together. And he did. And pretty soon there were some sparks and some smoke and a fire started. And that fire got carried on the breeze and it started to spread throughout the whole meadow. He was kind of afraid. You know, he was afraid that the whole thing was gonna burn up. But she said, not to worry, it would be all right. And as he watched, the fire burned out to the edges of the meadow and then stopped. And then she told him that she wanted him to do something for her. And that if he did that, he would never be lonely again. So she told him to take her by her hair and to buy her hair to drag her across the meadow. He didn't want to do that. He didn't, he didn't want to hurt her, but she said, it will be all right. So he did what she asked. He took her hair and he started, he couldn't even look at her. He didn't want to hurt her. So he took her hair and he pulled her up and down and around and around through that what had been the meadow and was now burned ground. And somehow she kept getting lighter feeling, you know, not so heavy anymore. And pretty, after a while, he couldn't feel her weight at all. And he turned around and looked and she was gone. But everywhere that he looked, where she had been, where he had taken her across the land, there were green things sprouting up. And from those sprouts came the very first corn. Oh. Well, the corn woman, corn spirit, was gone. You know, all he had left was in his hands just the feeling of her beautiful, long, soft hair. And that made a memory for him. But an interesting thing happened. As the corn was growing and ripening, other human beings found him. And they were attracted to him and to this new food that was growing. And so a whole village started to be created and it grew up and eventually Two Feathers found a woman to be his wife and had children. But every year when the corn season came, the whole village would stop and would have a, a big celebration to celebrate the green corn coming ripe. And when each year Two Feather held a corn cob in his hands, a, an ear of corn, and would start to peel it, he would feel the corn silk. And it reminded him 
of the wonderful gifts that corn woman had given him and to the other human beings. He gave them fire. He gave them corn, which was an important food. And he gave them community. And that's the end of that part of the Abenaki creation stories. And that's how that goes. Oh, hey. Thank you so much, Anne, for this good story. Um, now, Anne and Louise and I are going to have a little discussion. And uh, I want to encourage you that if you have questions or things you'd like to ask, to put them into the uh, Q&A for, and uh, we'll get to them in a little while. Um, First of all, for both of you, thank you so much. The stories were so beautiful. Um, and I was wondering um, from both of you, um, if you could talk a little bit about how you see your stories as being connected to the land. Louise, do you want to start? I knew you were going to say that, my friend. You that. You're a guest. Yes. Such a sweet, uh, uh, such a sweet nature of community, whereby if you have a guest, your guest is fed first, is acknowledged first. Thank you. Um, well, I guess there's no way that in any of the stories that have been shared with me over the years from elders, and I, as a child, I lived on the land and also during my early uh, womanhood, lived on the land, um, everything happens there. So, you know, you can, well, I used to, I used to uh, travel with an elder whose name was Angela Sidney. She's one of my number one mentors, teachers, uh, extraordinary storyteller. And as we would drive down the highway because she wanted to come into the city, she would point out certain, um, places along the way, little landmarks. And she'd say, you remember? You remember that guy who was up there? I said, no, I don't remember. <laughs> so uh, the peoples wherever they lived is where the story was birthed. And according to my understanding, my limited understanding of things. And of course, we have four four different categories of story. One is the creation story. That was a marvelous creation story that you shared with us, and thank you. Yeah, we have many creation stories. I believe each nation has their own creation stories about how this whole thing got started here. And I do recall once I had the bounty of being in Alaska among some very elderly women and um, I guess the anthropologist, whoever was there, was asking about old stories and was trying to find out, you know, if the people were around during the period of, you know, woolly mammoth and volcanoes and eruption. And she said, well, I have very old story. She said. And this story takes place when the world was just cooling off. It's an old story. <laughs> So, you know, if we look at if we look at our history, and you mentioned eight thousand years, and you know some of the some of the prehistoric uh, animals that were discovered in the Yukon, the woolly mammoth, and the saber-toothed tiger, and the camel, and all of that, you know, twenty thousand years old. But some of the elders will make reference to that, and there is, you know, these paleontologists, all of the ologists, archaeologists, anthropologists, paleontologists, all come to look in the dirt. And I remember this one elder, he, he asked his uh, friend, you know, Richard Harrington, who did a lot of research in the North. Every year he came there for about 10 years. And every every year he would hire Dick Nukon, who was a Kuchin man from the most northerly region of the Yukon, it's around the Old Crow around Crow River, Porcupine Caribou Herd Trail. And one year, uh, Dick asked him, Richard, what are you looking for? He said, oh, you wouldn't know. Well, try me, he said. He said, I'm looking for the bones of the hairy elephant. Well, I know where they die, he said. <laughs> and when he was a little boy, his grandma told him the story. She said, you know, these 
they had a certain name for it. I cannot recall at the moment, but she said these big creatures, they got big long nose. And when they're gonna die, she said they put their trunk in the water. They die beside the river. I don't know, maybe try to revive themselves. And so this is the big find uh, for this um, paleontologist. Um, yeah, and the rest is history. But for all those years, the people never consider just asking the local people, you know, where these things might be found. So everything is attached to the land. And also in the sky is also totally attached to the land. So, you know, it's part of the land, part of the air, part of the water, the spirit of all of that together. That's a pretty long answer, but that's my understanding. It's a good answer. Thank you. Yes. And do you have something you'd like to add to that or yeah, what your perspective is? I, I, I think that one of the things that, um, that comes to me in, in the stories that I tell uh, is reminding me of stories that I heard from my grandfather and from my mother and father growing up that reference you know, particular times of year. I can remember um, traveling with my, my grandparents down in Massachusetts because they had moved down to uh, an area in Plymouth County. And, um, and my grandfather and grandmother taking me to a place where the, uh, the herring come up every year uh, from the ocean to go up river to spawn. In fact, there's, it's a very, there's, a, there's a very famous place in Middleborough, Massachusetts where people go to, to see the herring run. Um, but on the way home one day to New Hampshire, uh, we were driving along, my mother and I, and she started pointing out um, bushes by the side of the road, young saplings, and, and telling me those are, those are, we call the shad bush, because when they're blossoming, that's when the shad, the herring, are, are coming up river to spawn. You know? And so I think of in the stories, you know, we tell, we hear, um, the story of Gluskabi and the maple trees. And we know there's one time of year in the spring when you can take the sap from the tree. And we hear the story of a corn mother and we know that there's a time of year when the green corn is, is coming har you know, to be harvestable. And we hear things like, uh, you know, the story about the shad bush. I, I, I pointed out to my children when they were little. Now I pointed out to my grandchildren and tell them this is something that my mother and my grandfather told me about. You know what's passed along in the story is not only the uh, the spiritual um, and intellectual ideas of the people, but also the, the the information we need to sustain ourselves, to understand, to know that everything comes in its own season. Kind of like Eccles was it is in Ecclesiastics to every to every time there's a season, or you know, to understand that um, that life is precious. And, and one needs to do what must be done in any given time of year in order to sustain life. Those things were critical. And that kind of information was absolutely necessary and was embedded in the stories along with other information about you know, how to behave uh, oneself in, in relation to nature, in relation to community, uh, you know, the pact with information yes, what we need to know about how to living on the earth, but also what we need to know to live well, to live in, in balance uh, with all of creation. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I want to sort of, you know, move right from that to the question I was going to ask, which is um, what cultural values, values you're seeing in the stories and particularly what cultural values you see in terms of um, what we're talking about uh, in this series, which has to do with climate change and um, and exactly what you were saying, how, how we do live um, uh, with the earth, with all our relations. So I was wondering if, um, if uh, both of you have things to comment about, not necessarily just the stories you told, but any of the stories that, that you know. Maybe we can uh, have Louise uh, yeah. talk about that again. Well, I think I shared this little story with you already, and so please bear with me. I love your stories. Go <laughs> I, for it. <laughs> I love those stories. Anna and I are just new friends, so we're sharing stories with each other. Um, well, for those people that don't know, the 
if you know the territory, well, Alaska, uh, what is the river that flows through it? It's the Yukon. And at one point in history, the Yukon River ran from north to south and it emptied into the Pacific Ocean. Can you believe that? And I'd, I had no idea. And, um, you know, people were starting to talk about glaciers melting. And then I would hear stories from the elders where they talked about living amongst the ice and that you must never cook food near the glacier because the glacier will start moving. Like the glacier is a living spirit, it's a living being, it's alive. So you had to always be very respectful. And if you were traversing on top of the glacier, you had to keep very quiet. So therefore little children were not uh, taken to walk on the glacier. If you're gonna go inland from the west, from the um, Southeast Alaska region, inland to the Yukon. And uh, Grandma Kitty Smith told me, she said, you know, the Yukon, you don't always go that way. I was very surprised. She said, used to be big glacier. He cut them off. He make them go other way, she said. That's a pretty old story. So any glaciologists, I mean, there used to be always a crew of them in the Yukon making these discoveries about what happened. So in, in the last uh, 20 years, you know, consulting with elders, I said, you know, what do you think about this? I said, not the first time this happened. And it makes people really work together, they said, to survive. You're going to work together. And so those, those uh, periods of great hardship called on the leaders, called on those of, with the most intelligence to make tough decisions about what to do. So those are just a few thoughts I have on that. Cheryl. Thank you. Thank you, Louise. You know, um, it was very interesting to me because we had recorded Louise's story and mine ahead of time to just be able to relax and listen, you know, to be detached and to listen. <laughs> this guy was a true gift. And, um, and it gave me a, a, an opportunity to ponder, you know, a little more deeply what's in those stories. And I was struck um, with the creation story that in a way I had not been before and thinking that it's Earth Day and such, but the rock people, you know, they were hard. The story tells us they were hard and they were uncaring and they were thoughtless about how they moved on the earth. And then, you know, when the, the ash tree people came, they were, they had a way of living in harmony with, with the world. And it struck me that, you know, the, the many of the problems that the climate issue problems today are because people have um, moved to become hardened, to be to be unaware of how they need to live in, in harmony or in relations respectfully with the earth. And instead, many have become uncaring. And so that causes great damage, you know, and so there's a there's a there's a lesson in that story that's important today as it was thousands of years ago um, about how we need to walk carefully, think carefully, act carefully in relation to this mother that sustains us. And, you know, Louise is talking about, and there, of course there have been these tremendous climate changes in the past and glaciers moving and volcanic action and coastal shifts, you know, they say off the East Coast, um, there have been remains found um, offshore under the water of what used to be land here. We've already had ocean rise here on the East Coast. And it, it's just, uh, we're at a critical time. We need to know that the earth will continue, <laughs> but the people who have changed from rock people to ash people might turn to something else someday if we don't learn how to walk carefully and respect our mother. 
Oh, that's wonderful. Thank you. Uh, one of the things I've often thought about in terms of uh, Abenaki people being created from trees is um, that in a very real way, our life came from the forest. We are, in fact, children of the forest um, and not separate from it. So um, I really appreciated your telling that story and also your uh, interpretation of that part of it. I want to move a little bit in um, and ask a little bit about um, what does it mean to become a storyteller and how you became storytellers? Louise, you know I'm going to defer to you, please, if you want to tell us a little bit of your story. You know, I was a very privileged child. I grew up with my grandmother from the time I was very little. Uh, she kind of just come and abducted me, <laughs> that I need company. And uh, so I, I lived with her for quite a bit of the year. And of course, she had all her friends. And her friends spoke many languages. So I would hear these stories in different languages, as well as English. Mm. And so that's, I, I developed a, an appetite, I guess. I developed a, a yearning for these stories. And uh, my and whenever my siblings would come, we'd all jump into bed with grandma at night. She would encircle us around her and begin to tell stories. And of course, one of my little brothers would nod off and my little sister and, and eventually I would go to sleep. And then the next night, grandma would say to me, okay, Louise, you got to start from where you went to sleep. You know, tell this story up until you went to sleep. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> Sometimes I was not listening. But uh, I always do recall that. And um, it wasn't until I moved to the city from the small village in northeastern Yukon with my three daughters. We moved into the city and I was to be away from elders that I realized how precious these stories were, that I had heard all my uh, childhood and my adolescence and, and as a young woman, as a young mother. And I knew that moving to the city, my children would be deprived. And at that same time, a beautiful book called My Stories Are My Wealth was published by uh, the Council for Yukon First Nations uh, with the help of an anthropologist who interviewed three beautiful matriarchs, three beautiful women tellers. And it just was published the year I was there. It was like it was divine providence to me. And so I would read these stories in the voice of the tellers because I knew the three elders. And uh, a woman at the radio station, a First Nations woman, she said, have you read that book? I said, oh yeah, I just love it. She said, why don't we have that story on the radio in the morning before the children go to school? You come and you read these stories in the voice and I said that's fantastic she said and I'll pay you well I didn't like that part but I thought no I'm going to take the pay so what I would do is I would tell the stories while the people the children were eating their wheaties all the children of the Yukon not just the indigenous and I would get paid and then I would go and pay the old ladies and they were just thrilled. And I remember Kitty Smith said, that's the easiest hundred dollar I ever made. <laughs> <laughs> so that's how I got started. And then I got myself. Fantastic. Yeah. It just grew from there. <laughs> it does. Yeah, once you, start, once you start hearing the stories and telling them, you're right, it, it, it grows. Um, you know, I, I didn't, I was fortunate to grow up. With, with two parents who were storytellers. And so I heard family stories. My father had gone back into the military after World War II. The job market um, was, was hard right after people got home from fighting. Mm. And so he went to school for a little while and then uh, um, he went back into the military. And so I grew up being um, an Air Force brat and moving as we called them the service brats. Um, and moving all over the world. So here I am, um, the child of New England parents born in Wichita, Kansas, 
uh, my, my sister was too. And we lived in the Philippines and in Germany and France and Ohio and Maryland. And we lived all over the place, but they, my parents grounded us in our families and in New England with the stories they told. But they, they were stories, generational stories of our family. Of course, they also took us camping all the time. And so I learned how to you know, live in balance, and what to, what to do in nature, how to be in touch with nature. Because even when we lived in big cities, my, my father always and my mother took us camping everywhere so that we would um, have a sense of what, you know, what we needed to know, what the earth you know, really was, not in the big cities and the cars and the you know, towering buildings. But I didn't know the traditional stories the way you know Louise had such the bounty of being able to hear those and and learn them from her grandmother and from other elders, so for me I, I became a storyteller myself when I became a parent. Um, when I became a mother, I, I I really you know I think we all do you know we think about what kind of parent do we want to be and what information you know what what um, what do we want our children to really know that's important to us. And for me, you know, I have uh, English, Scottish, Irish, Welsh, I'm told German and one Swedish great, great, great grandmother somehow uh, moved to Maine and, and got into the, the family tree. But here is where I live and our Abenaki heritage is, was very important to me. And I always knew about it because my mother would tell me and um, what her grandfather had taught her, it seemed very close to me because I knew him until I was about 10 years old. His mother was Abenaki. Um, and here's where we live. I live here in the Northeast. I live in New England. And here's where I'm raising my children, not in Europe. Um, and so I knew they would hear all those stories. I wanted them to, to learn the stories of, of the Abenaki people and also the Mohawk people. My husband has Mohawk heritage. Um, and so I started looking around, you know, where was I going to get this information? And here I have to give great thanks, um, you know, to uh, Olioni, to Joseph Bruchak, who's an amazing Abenaki storyteller. And just about the time I was trying to learn how to tell these stories, in the early 1990s, um, he began to publish a series of books with his partner, Michael Goduto. Um, and the two of them, they were keepers of the earth and keepers of the animals and keepers of life and keepers of the night. And his voice as a storyteller was so touching to me, even just written, that I, then I had to go seek him out. And then I, then I found every storyteller I could find and, and went and listened. I apprenticed myself to, to go hear the stories because it's hearing the stories that you can become, you can internalize them and start to become a storyteller. And every storyteller I've ever met is gracious and wants to pass the stories on. You know, the stories are living entities and they need the breath of life in them. They need to be shared. They need to be passed on. And this is one of the things that I learned from, from hearing other tellers. And was so grateful to be able to share that with my daughters and have one of my, you know, my daughters are in their 30s now. I have granddaughters who love to tell those stories. You know, my, with my younger granddaughter in, in kindergarten, you know, they were giving everybody their best this award and best that award. And little Marilyn came home with the best storyteller award. I didn't even know they had a storyteller award. <laughs> it was delightful to see that going on. My younger daughter, Amanda, she, she did some time um, at, is it called Montezuma's Castle? strange name out in Arizona um, yeah. as a park ranger and what she did was tell stories you know instead of just giving statistics she had she had gone with me she had apprenticed herself to me when I was going out telling stories when she was growing up and she found that rhythm and that cadence and so when she was in Arizona she found you know the the, the people there the indigenous people and asked if there were stories that she could share you know, so it's something that you learn from other storytellers and then it, it becomes stronger the more stories you hear. I, I also remember hearing um, Wolf Song, who was a wonderful Abenaki storyteller from Maine. He passed on too young, too, too early, but he gave that gift of, of stories and that lives, he lives with them. 
you know, through them, through us sharing and remembering. I want to thank the two storytellers so much, Kitsi Leuni, and thank all of you for coming. Uh, please visit the Center for the Humanities website. Um, that will be posted in the chat. Um, and the recording for tonight's event will also be available soon at, at this web, same website. Um, so thank you very much. And that's all from us tonight. Thank you, too. Thank you. Thank you it's too. been an honor. Thank you. Merci.